Well, it's good to be with you once again, and I return to our studies in the Lord's Temptation. Uh, and as I said already, I'm focusing our attention on Matthew's uh, Matthew chapter 4, dealing with the temptation of our Lord. And although Mark and Luke both record elements of it, uh, as I've said before, we stick with Matthew chapter 4 for the sake of our studies uh, in this subject. So we come then tonight then to uh, the third of our Lord's temptations. You remember we commenced our study last time. Well, you may not remember. It's a month ago. So you, you may remember the last time we commenced our study uh, with the words of verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. This evening it will be our concern to begin at verse 8, that's where we're starting again. The devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. So we're beginning then at verse 8 for our study tonight. So we're looking now not at the pinnacle of the temple but to an exceedingly high mountain to which our Lord Jesus was taken to be tempted further by Satan. The first thing we need to understand or endeavour to do is to understand indeed what is actually meant by the teaching of Matthew here. By these very words that we're looking at, we have to ask last time, so we ask tonight, is our Lord's experience imaginary or is it literal? In other words, was this an actual occurrence that we read of in verse 8 here, or are we to understand this in a figurative sense. Was our Lord literally, physically taken up onto a high mountain or was it as in the case, uh, was it a case of the devil himself, Satan, coming to him in his imagination, which he does with us sometimes, and putting this particular temptation into his mind like some vivid and dramatic, amazing picture. Try and, we're going to try and understand something about that. As we noted last time, whether our Lord was taken up literally to a mountain top, as we read here, or he was taken up in a vision-like experience, doesn't change the fact that the temptation was real and it was immensely powerful and attractive. If we are to see this as a literal occurrence, physical occurrence, in other words, that the Lord was actually taken to some mountain, well, it could have been the Mount of Olives, as some commentators say, or Mount Nebo, or Tabor in Lower Galilee. Uh, we're not sure at all which mountain it was. Last time, when we looked to this passage with regard to the pinnacle of the temple, I favoured a literal, physical situation that our Lord was taken bodily, literally, uh, up to the pinnacle of the temple. I'm not being dogma dogmatic about that. It's my own personal view of what Matthew says. As far as this third temptation concerned, is concerned, I lean more to a visionary kind of experience. In other words, that Satan worked on the imagination of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, so that he would fill his mind with these things that he was offering him uh, for his worship and his adoration. So one thing to be certain then is that our Lord in some sense was taken to the top of this mountain peak. Was he taken literally? Was he taken in his imagination? It seems to me not possible or not very uh, acceptable interpretation to say that our Lord was taken literally to the top of some mountain. And a number of commentators point out the difficulties with regard to that. Because you could not see from any mountain top all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, except perhaps in a representative sense. But I, it seems to me it's better here, much more like to see this as an astounding vision our Lord was given by Satan himself. An astounding, magnificent picture was put before him in his imagination. So that in a moment of time, all the kingdoms of the glory of the world were fixed in his mind by satanic power. Now, before we discount that, we know something of the power of imagination. 
If you're a driver, you will know. There have been times you've been driving along the East Lancashire Road, around to where you, where you live, to, to, to the shops or whatever, and you suddenly realise you're at the shops, you're at your destination, and you don't remember having driven. You're so familiar with that, that drive, that road you've taken so many times. And where has your mind been? Your mind has been in other things. Not necessarily illegitimate things, could be family things, could be your holiday you're planning. So in your imagination you're picturing that beautiful beach or that lovely house you want to buy or that wallpaper for your living room or whatever you're going to do. So the imagination is very powerful and Satan could have done that with our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's assume then that the best way of understanding this temptation is in terms of a vision an experience of our Saviour in which he had placarded before his mind all the splendours, all the pleasures, all the glories of this world, as Luke tells us, in a moment of time. Everything concertinaed, as it were, into a moment of time. And that happens in our imagination also. Now, there are similar statements elsewhere, of course, in Scripture. And you might remember, in, for example, in the, in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 40, uh, the people of God in uh, captivity in Babylon, we read these words that he, uh, of Ezekiel here. In the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was captured, on the very same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he took me there in the visions of God he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain toward the, uh, sorry on it toward the south was something like the structure of a city so he saw this magnificent edifice but it was in his imagination or in a vision as it were and so we have this kind of thing uh, in the Old Testament you have it also in the book of Revelation and in chapter 20 in Revelation verse 21, rather, Revelation 21, and in verse 10. I'll read from verse 9. And the, the Apostle John has been given an insight, a vision of the new Jerusalem. And he says this, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And then here are the words, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and etc., and etc. So, no doubt that the, the, each of these views was breathtaking to Ezekiel and to the Apostle John. And there can be no doubt that the vision that our Lord saw under Satan's direction here, and remember, Satan is given permission by God to do this, all the kingdoms of the world are placarded before his gaze in, this, in his mind and imagination. Let's think about that for a moment. All the kingdoms of the world and their glory. What might that have been like to our Lord? We can only surmise, can't we? What an amazing array of powers and pleasures and wealth and honour and fame must have been displayed before the eyes, the mind of our Saviour. Cities and towns and villages with fields rich with produce, with cattle in a thousand hills, riches and splendour, magnificent palaces, valleys and forests and mountains, and possessions in incredible variety and abundance, and all the nations with their own essential beauty as well as a thousand manufactured things, objects of pleasure and delight, all that the heart could desire and wish for. And all this was presented to the mind of our Lord Jesus Christ in a moment of time. The whole grandeur and the glory of this world was put before the gaze of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think we have to admit that temptation must have been profoundly attractive and powerful indeed. So we need to ask a question though. Did the devil actually have all this in his possession? Did Satan have this as something he could give to the Lord Jesus? Because he said, it's been delivered to me. 
What was it really at his disposal to give it as it pleased him? Could Satan have fulfilled his promise to Jesus if Jesus had bowed down and worshipped him? Well, the initial point I would make is no. He lied to Jesus, but he gives the impression he can give it. That's one way of looking at it. Now, there are some portions of the Bible, of course, that seem to suggest that the devil has unlimited power. For example, in John's Gospel and in chapter 10, we read these words in John's Gospel uh, chapter, I'm not sure I've got my te- references mixed up here. John chapter 12, sorry, in verse 31. We read these words. After Jesus uh, said his soul was troubled and so on, he says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So, in some sense, Satan was the ruler of this world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 4, Paul speaks of Satan as the god of this age. And we find in, in uh, 1 John 5, 19, for example, John says, The whole world lies under the sway of the evil one. Satan has immense power and authority at his disposal, bearing in mind always with divine permission. So he has limited measures of power and authority. It's a delegated power. It's something given to him uh, as was given to, jo- given to Satan in the days of Job. Remember the case of Job. The Lord said to, to Satan, you can, as long as you spare his life, basically. We won't turn to the passage, but you know the story well. So there are, but there are very clearly other verses that completely overturn the idea that the devil has ultimate absolute power. What are those verses? For example, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27 Jesus says, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. Or in Matthew 28, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Or in Ephesians, in chapter 1, in verse 22, we read that God has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Or in Colossians, in the book of Colossians, We read these words also in Colossians 1.16. Speaking of Jesus, it says, For by him all things are created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. What about chapter 2 and verse 3 of Colossians? We read there, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So what do we make of this? Well, first of all, Satan, as I said, had a limited authority. But he was a liar, he's a deceiver, he's the murderer of the souls of men. And he tried to deceive Jesus. He tried to get Jesus to do something that was utterly, utterly abhorrent to him and to God the Father. And Satan has been doing this down the centuries for thousands of years, deluding and deceiving the minds of men and women and children. Why is the world in the mess it's in tonight? Because Satan is a great deceiver. And men and women throughout the world follow his direction and his leading. But we must remember this great truth. When the devil offered Jesus the kingdoms of the world, he was offering Jesus what had already been promised to him. Psalm 2, God says to his son, Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the end of the earth for your possession. And you remember those words of that wonderful Psalm 72. Let me read some of those verses for you. Psalm 72, speaking of Christ and his glory and his wonder, he owns and prevails over all things. So Psalm 72, look at verse 8, for example. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Verse 11, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. Verse 17, his name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun, and all shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. 
or in verse 19 of Psalm 72. Uh, we read these words, Blessed be his glorious name forever and ever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And one day, we read in Revelation, one day the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So what's the point we're making here? The cross must come first. And the devil was endeavouring to get Jesus Christ to bypass the agonies of the cross. The devil is offering to Jesus a crown without the cross. He was placing before him an alternative way, a far easier way of obtaining a royal crown. An easier way of becoming king over all things, over the kingdoms of the world, if you but bow down and worship him, that is Satan. And there's no doubt, as I've said already, this was a most awesome and powerful temptation. Who would not be tempted by all the kingdoms of this earth and their glory and their splendor? And Jesus knew what his mission involved. He knew only too well the agonies predicted in Isaiah 53 Uh, that he would have to endure. It was not as if he was ignorant of the painful experience and indescribable pain that lay lay before him as he was to suffer suffer for our sins on the cross. He knew those words in Isaiah. In his own soul, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Or that he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He was cut off out of the land of the living. What a horrendous experience our Lord Jesus Christ was going to go through. And here's Satan saying to him, you don't have to do all that. You can avoid the agonies of the cross. There's an easier way. And furthermore, Jesus knew that all those Old Testament sacrifices typified his crucifixion. Typified his sufferings for the people of God. The agony, the blood, the gore, the distaste of sacrificial system, the whole system pointing forward to his coming to die for our sins. He was fully aware of Psalm 22 and those dreadful words that were descriptive of his demise on the cross. I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint, my heart is like wax. Again, consider that. When Satan comes to him, you don't have to face that. You don't have to go through the agony of the cross, the pain of crucifixion. You don't have to. And Jesus was faced with this then. And he knew those other words that would be on his lips were he to continue the path that he has chosen to be obedient to God in. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he must therefore have felt in the very depths of his soul the dreadful power, the attractiveness of the suggestion of the devil. Fall down and worship me. That's all you have to do. Jesus, you don't have to suffer. So as I say then, he was a way, according to the devil, by which all that suffering could be bypassed. Which of us enjoys suffering and pain? and sense of sorrow and abandonment, which Jesus would never experience what Jesus had to experience. But here was a way then to obtain the crown without the agonies of the cross. And all that Jesus is required to do is to bow the knee to Satan, to worship him and reverence him. But we see not only the temptation that was placed before our Lord we see the answer that he gave to Satan. It was clear. It was utterly uncompromising. It was decisive. It was final. Away from me, Satan. That's what Jesus says to him there. Look at the words again in verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And we have here, therefore, an expression of Christ's total disgust at the devil himself and the thing he was asking him to do. He's filled with revulsion at the sheer impudence 
of Satan and his suggestion. And we notice this further. We noticed this last time. The perpetuity of God's law here. Christ's answer to the devil. The continual authority of the word of God written centuries before this temptation, yet it's still valid. Our Lord says, doesn't he? You sh- it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God. This was written thousands of years before. It is written. It is written for all time and nothing has been altered. We mustn't worship anyone but God himself. This is the rule of life. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him. You shall not go after other gods. And the Lord is quoting through Deuteronomy chapter 6. But we notice furthermore, which I've hinted at already, Christ's response was not only decisive, it was instantaneous. There's no hesitation, no consideration given to Satan's suggestion to him. And our problem is we get into trouble because we consider the thing as being proposed to us so often when we're tempted to sin, whether it's in thought or word or deed. We get into trouble because we're not quick and and decisive enough in rejecting the devil's temptation and suggestion but then notice the words of verse 11 then the devil left him then the devil left him perhaps reminded of the words of James in James chapter 4 and verse 7 submit to God resist the devil and he will flee from you and very often, I did this myself for quite a long number of years until a number of years ago I realised I was misquoting or misunderstanding this text. I used to say to myself, the text says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But it doesn't. It says, submit to God. My first duty and responsibility as a Christian believer is to submit my mind and my soul to my creator, to my God. Then from that platform, I resist the devil and he will flee from me. And that's what James is saying. And that's what Jesus does here. He submitted himself to the word and the will of God. He resisted the devil and the devil fled from him. But we must recognize that we must use the means of grace that God has given us. We must be prayerful men and women, diligent students of the Bible faithful in church attendance, in fellowship with one another, and so on. And the Lord's table, if we're believers, we should be frequently coming to the Lord's table. Because we can't expect the devil will let us go easily. He's got it in his grip. Once we begin to succumb to his temptation, we're troubled. You know, is it not true to say that as believers, we're horrified at times to discover not only the hidden depravities of our own hearts, The things that Satan wants us to do. Places he wants us to go. Things he wants us to say. And so on the occasions when he comes at us with the most awful and detestable specific temptations and you say, where in the world did that come from? I don't want that. In my heart of hearts, I can say with the Apostle Paul, in my innermost man, I love the law of God. But there's this enemy Sin and Satan coming and stirring up these things. So we must remit, we must forget that Satan has an enormous range of temptations to bring against God's children. And his power is great. I remember speaking to a young lady when I was studying at college in Glasgow. And she was very, very blasé about it. She thought, she said to me something like, well, I can easily overcome Satan. And I said, ah, oh, Yeah. You know, and I'm sure she discovered many years since then, that's over 50 years ago, she discovered how wrong she was. But there is power in our Saviour, which is superior to the devil's power. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Lord Jesus Christ dwells in us by his Spirit. And there's power in Christ given to us to deal with filthy, ungodly, degrading things that Satan brings against us. And we are to rely on that. Remember Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
And no temptation is so great that it can't be overcome by the power of Jesus Christ. No temptation is overtaking you except such as is common to man. You remember how Paul puts that in 1 Corinthians 10. With the temptation, he makes a way of escape that we might be able to endure it or bear it. We recognize, therefore, when Satan comes to us, we are on our guard. And when we sin, we do not sin because we have to sin. Sometimes we think we have to sin, we don't have to sin. As someone has said, sin, all sins are rooted in the love of pleasure. Nobody forces us to sin. Nobody forces that filthy thought into our minds for us to keep it there, that suggestive idea, to keep it that angry disposition. Nobody forces us to act on it. We're never duty-bound to sin, whereas we're always duty-bound to listen to God's word and to obey him and to do what he says. So there's always, as I say, this way of escape. And then look at the conclusion of this in verse 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The devil left him, and behold, and I was take note, angels came and ministered to him. The change in our Lord's circumstances was immediate. From real hunger, which Jesus refused to satisfy by the devil's way, to a situation now where the angels of God come to him and supply all his food. Elijah fed by ravens, Jesus fed by angels. And there's no doubt that to resist the devil not only comes, uh, causes him to flee from us, but it becomes, as one writer says, the occasion of spiritual power and strength and consolation and joy and peace and renewed strength comes from every sinful, every sin that is overcome by the power of the Lord Jesus in our hearts. We won't turn to it now, but in Luke's account of this, he says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. That's in Luke 4.14, if you want to look at that later. And it's obvious, therefore, from his words, that the Holy Spirit's power was linked to our Saviour's victory over Satan. Just as surely as sin bleeds out our spiritual life, holiness of life empowers us for the service of Christ. Satan is a mighty foe, but Christ is mightier still. Let's be rid of the Achans in our camp. I mean unconfessed sins in our hearts. Let us, whether young or old believers, let us walk with God closely. And this passage in the scriptures here, and all that it contains, should be a great consolation to us as God's people. Remembering our beloved Saviour, who bled on the cross, who refused to submit to Satan, that he might redeem your soul and mine from eternal death. What a glorious Master and Saviour he is. He is our Lord. He is our Mediator. He is our mighty Champion. Let me conclude by reading verses of a hymn, and then we shall sing our closing hymn. Listen to these words, you know them well. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Saviour to help you. Comfort, strengthen and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Shun evil companions, bad language, disdain. God's hold, name hold in reverence, nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest, kind-hearted and true. Look ever to Jesus. He will carry you through. To him that o'ercometh, God giveth a crown. Through faith we shall conquer, though often cast down. He who is our saviour, our strength will renew. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. We have that Jesus as our Saviour. If you're a Christian tonight, he is your Lord and your Saviour, and he will carry you through.